So I love the, this, this lyric of this song, Overjoyed. All the world has conspired to remind us this notion that underneath, deep inside, here's the chance to be overjoyed. And it's always interesting to me to think about peace at this time of year because it's, it, it's, it always stands in counterpoint to the reality we live in. Every single, I don't know how many Christmases you've been through. I've been through a bunch, more insightfully perhaps than the more recent ones. Doesn't matter, seems like every year at this time of year there's always this juxtapositioning of the reality with the dream, with the hope. And the challenge, I think, is, especially as we think about this season, this idea of gift of peace. Well, how do you receive this gift of peace? How do you actually make use of this idea of peace in this season we live in, in this time that we live in? So, first of all, what does it even mean, peace? So I'm not going to ask you a rhetorical question. I'll ask you flat out, and you can just shout it out, or you can raise your hand, and I'll point at you. But what does peace mean to you? Where have you experienced peace? One word, two word phrase. Stillness? All rightness. All rightness. As in not all wrongness, or as in being okayness? As in both. All rightness, okay. Something else, thank you. Inner calmness, okay. Serenity, thank you. Yeah, some other ideas. What, is, what does peace mean to you? Where, or a place where you've experienced it? Home alone. And not the Macaulay Culkin home alone, but quiet home alone. Okay, yeah, and something else, yeah? Church, church. experienced it here at church. Even during an R, a run D&C song, yeah? Something in the back? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> understanding, understanding. And then Lynn was pointing at somebody. Holding the baby. Holding the baby. All right. <laughs> really? When the baby's you have mastered discipleship. <laughs> you have mastered inner Zen calm. <laughs> so this is interesting because I asked it of a group, our, our Wine and Wishful Thinking group this past week. And of course, very similar answers. And, and um it's interesting to me that, you know, at Christmas time, too, we have images of, these, of peace. And, and yet we also live, many of us live with uh, this discontent reality in our, in our, in our life. Um, the loss of someone we love, uh, some kind of disjoint, disjuncture in the family. Um, so maybe it's a personal crisis with any number of things, addictions or debt or any number of emotional issues. I mean, the reality is, is that it's, it's hard to have that sense of peace that most of us were echoing in here, calm, inner calm, peace, stillness, quiet, um, music. It's, it's, it's the same kinds of images came up. Now, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to pick up these devotionals, uh, it, um, and, and so I decided I would use one of them to sort of highlight that you might want to go and pick them up and read some of the other ones. But, uh, my, and I asked Mike if it was okay. Mike Marshall had one in for this week on the notion of peace. And it was his granddaughter. I don't know if you read this one. But his granddaughter, during the summertime, she came over this past summer. I think she's three or four, maybe four and a half. And she, um, they, they put out a pool. It was hot, and the kids were there. They put out an inflatable pool. And, and uh, as soon as the water was in it, his granddaughter was the first one to jump into it. And then she stood up as, as everybody was making the, moving around in chaos. And she sort of put her, her hand into her, into her palm, and she said, Everyone be hush. She did that a couple of times till so everybody got quiet and then she said, here are the rules for the pool. <laughs> and then she started reciting rules, which Mike said were pretty bizarre, some of them, but it was clear after a while, he said, that some of the rules were particularly designed for her big brother <laughs> to prevent him from getting in and, you know, splashing and ca creating chaos. Seems to me that we do that at Christmas time. Seems to me that all of Christmas, as opposed to overjoyed, seems to be designed to try to create this sense of peace. But unfortunately, if you're like me, many of you after Christmas are wondering, it's gone. Where'd it go? 
Did it ever show up here? There was some good high moments, but now it's back to the crunch. Now it's back to the routine. And now it's back to uh, waiting another 150 days until Hallmark starts their movie series, you know, for 121 days. We try to get control. We try to find this peace. We seem to miss it. And so here we have this biblical image, the peaceable kingdom, very familiar image. And um, if, if you remember the paintings, it's almost ubiquitous. Ubiquitous, You see these peaceful kingdoms. You see them as, as uh, ceramic sort of little statues and decorations. This idea of lambs lying down with wolves, of, of uh, calves laying beside uh, lions, kids playing with poisonous snakes. You know, there's a kid roaming around in the scene, and you have all these, these completely dis- the, um, um, contradictory sort of animals, you know, carnivores with vegetarians, you know, sitting in this peaceful setting. And you think, how is that even possible? The problem is, is as, um, as uh, well, um, and I can't remember her first name now, but Borstein, who was a wonderful writer and an activist and also a, a Zen a student. She wrote in this book, It's Easier Than You Think. She says, a lot of the problem that we have with getting to this place of peace is because we are so conditioned in our responses that we never questioned our very, we never questioned our very conditioning. And so when we see things, we come right to the assumption, right to the familiar, and then we move on beyond. It's really hard to get underneath the conditioned responses. And so when you read devotions or you hear preachers talk about this peaceable kingdom, this vision of Isaiah in the midst of their Israelite kingdom, once again, trying to be what God had expected them to be, once again, failing and focusing on the rich and the powerful and missing out on the poor and the, and the, uh, um, and the, and the stranger and the ostracized, and once again, here's the prophet coming up to the crowd saying, you forgot, you're still not getting there, here's what it's supposed to look like, and throwing this image out. And we think, well, it's just absolutely impossible. You can't get there. Why, why would we even think we could get there? So we don't really think about it. And I think maybe that's a subconscious thing we do. Feels hard, feels impossible. Can you ever imagine that happening? So we just leave it as sort of a netherland kind of image, a beautiful sort of image, sort of like we love to see Jesus in the manger with all the pretty animals around. And, and we just sort of put things in safe places. It's so hard to get underneath. So here's I want to suggest something, a couple of things. First, a quote from Einstein, one of my favorite theologians. And it's been echoed by other scientists and certainly other theologians. But he said, a human being is part of the whole. A human being is part of the universe, a part limited in time and space, though he experiences himself, his thoughts, his feelings, as something separated from the rest. It is a kind of optical delusion of consciousness, what perhaps Borstein would say, just another conditioned response. He goes on and says, this delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. I believe in our culture right now, the, the common term that's being bantered around is called tribe. That now we are in tribes is the sort of contemporary understanding of our communities. The delusion that this is a kind of prison for ourselves, that we restrict our personal desires and affection to a few persons who are nearest to us. Our task, he says, must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion, to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in this beauty. I think what's interesting about this insight of, of, of Einstein is that it's uncannily close to the idea of Christian theology's incarnation. God is present with us. Paul, Apostle Paul's notion, or Paul Tillich, the theologian's notion, that God is the very ground of being, that God is present with us, within us, underneath all the world conspiring to remind us deep inside. And also with Jesus' own teaching, does it not? Jesus' own teaching, which I read from, the, from Matthew 25 a couple of weeks back, 
when his disciples were saying, okay, you're leaving, you know, and Jesus says, well, don't forget, when you feed the poor, when you clothe the, hun- the naked, when you give f- food for the hungry, when, when you visit the sick, and when you visit the ones in prison, when you, when you encounter these strangers, that's when you're doing it to me. And to everyone you don't, then you're not to me. There's this notion of this connectedness with what is sacred already present underneath in between us. And yet, as a friend of mine once said, Miss Legato, to feel compassion toward another, ultimately, we have to learn to feel it for ourselves. I've talked about Miss Legato before. Miss Legato was a nurse at the Texas the Tarrant County Medical Education Foundation. We just called it TC Murph, and I'm not even sure if it's still around over by Harris Hospital. I was a social worker just out of school, and I was working with a methadone clinic, and I had 122 um, narcotic addicts on my caseload. And as a 24-year-old, I would sometimes get pretty impatient, but not just as a 24-year-old. As a person who grew up in an alcoholic and abusive family, I was pretty impatient with, uh, with substance abusers personally. I tried to rise above it theologically, spiritually, but I found myself very impatient with the lack of progress that folks would make sometimes. And because I had the power to decide just how much dosage of methadone they would get depending on their behaviors or the reports about them, because I had the power to also decide how their probation officers or their parole officers might deal with them dependent on how they've been or how I perceive they've been behaving. If someone were particularly sharp with me, I could get a little sharp back. And being young as I was, I figured it would help to assert myself even more. And there was a little bit of gratification I got in that. Although I have to admit I wasn't really in touch with it. But there was something I felt of being able to control this, uh, this situation in these folks' lives. And I remember Miss Legato took me aside once, and she's a little sh- short woman who was at the time probably in her late 60s, maybe even 70, and I was 24. She took me aside, and she was one of these folks that would like, and I'm not kidding, she would grab someone taller and pull them down. <laughs> she was not intimidated. And even I towered over her a little bit, so she grabs me and she sits me down in the chair. And she says, she says, folks don't get mad at others as easily as you do when they're at peace with themselves. She said, folks don't get mad at others so quickly, as easily as you do, when they're at peace with themselves. We have to learn to begin to cultivate compassion for ourselves in order to open up the doors widen the circles for others. She said it usually means that there's something in you that you haven't been dealing with. And she said the reality is is that knowing that they have been or that you have been in a similar place as them, perhaps you can begin to experience that not only have they been in a substance abuse setting like you grew up, but they've also been in that place that longed for love like you did. When we can recognize the ground of our needs with one another, as well as the ground of our common problems and struggles, but the the ground of our longing, if we can come to recognize that, we begin to open up the circle of compassion with others. There's a wonderful TED talk online that uh, you'll have to look it up, but it's called Take an Enemy Out for Lunch. (laughs) Now, I'm actually going to suggest two things to you because I actually also saw another uh, talk by another guy. It wasn't a TED talk, but I just happened to stumble across it. And um, it was all about finding uh, uh, the way in which we label people. And you see if this is true for you. We label people as enemy, as, as friends or as enemies and then occasionally as strangers. But this fellow was saying, we've lost the art of of seeing people as stranger. In other words, we jump right to enemy. If we don't know them, we just almost see them adversarially. So it's that challenge 